Welcome to our world today. We have one of my favorite people as a guest tonight, Rhoda Gilman. I've been so looking forward to this show. And um, Rhoda Gilman is a long, long time member of the Green Party. Now you are one of the state spokespeople. That's right. I'm a spokesperson, uh, one of several spokespeople for the state party and also a spokesperson for the St. Paul Green Local. And uh, I'm also a member of the uh, state central committee. Yes. So I, I'm keeping busy these days <laughs> yes, with an election exactly. campaign going on. <laughs> exactly. And um, you were with the, the Minnesota Historical Society as yes. a, professionally, were you? Yes, I uh, was there for 34 years. Most did a little bit of everything, but uh, mostly as an editor and researcher and writer. I edited the journal Minnesota History for a number of years and also supervised uh, the beginnings of our, our educational uh, school program. Really? Yes, I, uh, I in fact, uh, sort of uh, pioneered the, the first textbook of Minnesota history that the uh, State Historical Society published, which uh, came out in 1989 under the title uh, Northern Lights. Yes, I think I know that textbook. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, that's right. Oh, okay, and we can, as viewers can see, today we're going to talk about the Green Party <laughs> and right. how you have been involved in the Green Party since the very, very beginning. Yes, and pretty much, pretty much. And uh, as I understand it, the first Green Party meeting in the United States, or the beginning of the Green Party, started here in Minnesota. That's right. And as uh, I was telling you before we came on the air, we have, uh, I, I have great questions as to why it was in St. Paul. I have never found an answer to that. <laughs> Um, many of the people and the, fa the people that were actually leading it came from California. But there oh. must have been a reason that it mm -hmm. was held in St. Paul at McAllister College right. in August of uh, 1984. So anyone who knows the answer to that can Yes, can, can I, 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 I appre <laughs> appreciate uh, right. knowing what the, what the yeah. reason they chose McAllister College in McAllister was. College. And what, yeah. what year was that? 1984. 1984, the very beginning. Yes, that's, uh, I think, uh, if my math is correct, 22 years ago. <laughs> yes. Well, what a special position to be in. <laughs> and now, to look back. Well, I was not at that conference. I didn't even know about it at the time. Ooh. It was not until uh, about 1985, uh, a year later, that I really learned much about the Green Party and okay. learned that there had been. Mm -hmm. So, should we start out and tell people about the Green Party? Well, uh, the Green Party is uh, uh, currently a minor party in Minnesota. It was a major party from uh, 2000 to 2005, uh, as that by law is determined by the, the percentage of the votes you get in statewide mm -hmm. elections. And, uh, we are, uh, even though we are a minor party, we still consider ourselves major in terms of the issues and in terms of the uh, people out there who are looking to us mm -hmm. to point the way toward the future. Mm -hmm. But um, it's uh, uh, discouraging to be reduced from a major party to a minor party. Yes, which One is of the disadvantages is that we have to petition to get our candidates on the ballot. Right. And uh, I think a number of us are very proud that this year we got uh, four, well, five statewide candidates on the ballot um, and collected well over 17,000 signatures <laughs> in two of the hottest weeks of the right. summer. Only two weeks. Right. Only two weeks we had to do it. In and very hot There weather. was an outpouring of uh, support. I don't know how you could call it anything else. Right. Uh, for getting the Greens on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So we're here and right. uh, we're still a party. Yes, great. Still in contention. <laughs> yes, great. I, uh, I, think, uh, I think one of the things that is not recognized about the Green Party, we talk about it here in Minnesota and that's what we know about it mostly, mm -hmm. uh, but it is part of a worldwide movement. There are Green Parties in 90 countries the last last figures I saw. These change, of course, from mm -hmm. almost from day to day. 
Uh, and the last figure I saw was 47 states in the United States. That may be somewhat less now. That may have been oh. the top number. I don't know. But uh, we are not alone in the world. We no. are not just a, a local third party. Yes, that's so yeah. fascinating. About and the Green party. Um, you know, it's often said that uh, uh, those who have no history can't lay a claim to the future. Well, you can't say that about the Green Party. We do have a history, mm -hmm. and it goes back now. I would maintain for a half a century wow. uh, to uh, coming out of uh, World War II when the uh, first, uh, uh, the first intellectual, the first, there was the first recognition that ecology and the environment are vital to the future of uh, human societies. Was it the atomic bomb? Well, the atomic bomb was uh, a big part of it too. I mean, it, we suddenly realized that we had the power to destroy the world if we weren't careful. Yes. And that uh, that was that was part of it. Another part was the what was called at the time the population bomb, the uh, prediction that uh, unless checked, the human population would outrun the the uh, resources of, of the right. planet. Right. So we had we had a lot of things coming out of World War II that were uh, people who were uh, looking at the future were paying attention to uh, those who weren't absorbed in the Cold War and in day-to-day mm -hmm. -day politics. Uh, so um, uh, there were a number of books published. I'd just like to, you know, mention a few of them. You Good. may have read them. You've probably heard about Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Oh, my goodness, That yes. was published in 1962, and I think that uh, focused people's attention on the environment and yes. what we were doing to it. Uh, and. Another one, economists will remember uh, uh, the uh, Club of Rome report, written mainly by Donella Meadows. Uh, it was called The Limits to Growth. And it got a lot of attention from um, national leaders and uh, uh, people who were responsible for economics because it pointed out that you can't have a growth economy forever oh. in a limited planet. Oh, and yes. uh, so it, um, and it, it had the, the figures, facts and figures to prove yes. it. It was a serious study. Another book in 1973 was E.F. Schumacher's Small is Beautiful. I we, all, we all hear that, yes. that word, small is beautiful, but uh, right. it was the title of a book and it was very influential. And uh, then finally in 1979 we had uh, the scientist James Lovelock who uh, pointed out that life on Earth helped to shape the planet itself. Life was what was creating the atmosphere of the planet. Uh, the, the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen uh, in our atmosphere was governed by the life uh, that was developing and dependent on it, on the planet. And of course, we're so, aware of that now, but that's at right. that time, at it was something time, that really We, we brought, take it for granted now. Yes. And yet, uh, it was, it was a new thought then. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, through the 1960s and 70s, this gave rise to things like Earth Day. We did, we were oh, paying yeah. attention. Okay. Uh, the uh, movements like appropriate technology, you've probably heard that, mm -hmm. and local self-reliance, mm -hmm. and uh, back to the land. There back was a the strong land. movement in the 70s for going back to the there land. There was. And of course, there were anti-nuclear protests, mm -hmm. and um, and we were paying attention to the rights of minorities and women, too, as a result of the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. um, in Minnesota, um, the, um, I, I, I like to think of uh, these, these movements as all being sort of expressed and given voice by a little magazine that was published down in Millville, Minnesota from 1972 to 1989. Are you going to ask me where Millville is? <laughs> where is Millville? <laughs> Millville is somewhere, it's halfway between Zambroda and Wabasha. <laughs> oh, really? Right on the border of uh, Wabasha County. Oh my goodness. On the Zumbro River. Uh, little t a little town used to be a thriving little mill town, naturally. Mm -hmm. Uh, now it's uh, pretty much a bedroom community now for bigger towns, but it's uh, um, 
a lovely little place, and uh, it was where the North Country Anvil took root and was published. Uh, yes, here's, uh, you can see the, uh, some of the covers of the anvil. Um, this was uh, uh, Corn Woman, uh, and uh, this one was an issue on cleaning up the Mississippi River. It was, it was a lively little magazine, and mm -hmm. it was um, when it finally folded, because it had no real financial backing, mm -hmm. uh, and it refused to take advertisement <laughs> and uh, wouldn't go for foundation grants. No too many, corporate money back No then, corporate no, money, no foundation money, too many no, uh, yes. uh, strings attached. And uh, how is so the Anvil connected with the Green Party? It voiced most of the, the values that were eventually oh. um, congealed and took took uh, form in the Green Party and oh. that the Green Party expresses as its ten key values. Okay. Ten key values in this country. Maybe that's the reason why the first meeting was in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, not really, not because really. I don't think the anvil was that widely known, mm -hmm. but I, I did put together a uh, an anthology of the anvil ar articles oh, okay. and so on and uh, just thought that uh, yes. I, I'll make you a present of, oh, of the book. Thank you. May you may find it interesting. I think thank you. it has been very popular among Greens. Yeah, Ringing in the Wilderness. Ringing in the Wilderness. Great. It was published by so Holy much. Cow Press in Duluth. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'll treasure and, this. And uh, anybody that wants a copy could contact me. It's technically out of print now, but oh, okay. there are a few copies in, in boxes around mm -hmm. the state. And if people want to contact you, they could go to the website? To the website. Green, green Party website, uh, will reach me. Okay, which is um, www.greensmn.org. Www uh, yeah. I think we might have that on the screen anyway. Okay, <laughs> I hope we do. <laughs> yes. Thank you for this book. Well, that's, that's sort of, as I say, that's what I like to think of as the, the intellectual roots of the movement. And uh, politically, uh, it actually started in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, in, in England, the first party, uh, a little, little group called the People's Party, decided they'd use, they were stood for environmentalism and, and uh, ecology, and they chose the color green as their emblem. And so they yes, a perfect. were called the Green Party. Right. And, um, they still, because England, like us, has a um, uh, two-party system, they have not been able to grow into a major party. But in Europe, the movement took root immediately. And uh, by 1980, there were green parties in most of the European countries. They were still small parties. And they were regarded as idealistic and visionary, mm -hmm. uh, all, all those good things that are, are those good words that tell you you really aren't very important. <laughs> and, uh, I haven't thought about it like that and, before. Uh, the, all of the Green Parties throughout the world uh, mm -hmm. are united uh, by four pillars of, uh, four uh, ideological pillars, uh, grassroots democracy, social and economic justice, ecological wisdom, and nonviolence. Yes. And those are the four pillars. The Greens everywhere subscribe to those. Yes. If they don't, they aren't really Greens. Yes. Um, in 1983, Greens really hit the news when um, the German Green Party, led by a dynamic young woman named Petra Kelly. It was a woman uh, again. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, elected uh, 28 people to the Bundestag. And that was, it rocked the world. And the Bundestag is, is the, the equivalent of, of Congress okay. or the Parliament in Germany. Mm -hmm. They have a parliamentary system, not a uh, system like ours. But um, that, of course, made people think more about the Green Party. Yes. And I would like to say that there's, there's a big difference between the emerging green movement at that time and all of the environmental and conservation movements saving the whales, uh, mm -hmm. saving the redwoods, those are all good things. Mm -hmm. But the Green Party, at that time and still, uh, was distinguished by a systems approach. Uh, ecology itself evolved from systems theory, in a way, the application of systems theory to natural systems. 
Oh, could and, you explain uh, that a little bit? Well, this? that gets a little complicated. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't think we have time to get okay. into it. But um, the Green Movement sees all environmental and social problems as interrelated. Uh, you can't solve yes. one without solving yes. the other. Human society is a seamless web. And uh, it's, uh, there's uh, from agriculture to energy to peace to justice to feminism to population uh, to uh, economic uh, equality. There's nothing, you can't solve them in piecemeal. They yes. all relate to each other. Right. So, um, and one, I'll, I'll just read a quotation from uh, one Green in 1991. The big difference between single issue environmental campaigns and green politics proper is that the former treats symptoms while the latter deals with causes. Oh. So, you know, it, in a medical sense, we go to the causes, we don't treat the symptoms. Right. And uh, that makes us radical. Uh, the, you know, the very word radical uh, in Latin is derived, the, the, it comes from the word that means root. So if you go to the roots of things, you're a radical. And in order to, this, we'd have this to means change things at the roots. Big change. Big change big, at big the roots. Big time root. change. Big time change. And that, of course, is not easy for anybody. No. So, um, so there we come to 1984 when picking up on the the victory of the German Greens, Americans said, "Okay, time to get organized," right. and they. Uh, the conference at McAllister was led by two fairly familiar names, Frithjof Capra, who wrote uh, The Tao of Physics, and really? Charlene Spretnak, who had just published a book called Green Politics about the European Green Movement. Wow. Um, so they were really the people who called the conference and were, in a and sense, And neither are leaders. from Minnesota. Neither is from Minnesota. <laughs> so no. we, that mystery as, still exists. At least exists. at that time they weren't. Yeah. 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 And the, um, the conference accomplished two things. First, it, it did a remarkable job of um, articulating the values of the movement. We still use the 10 key values that that conference came up with. They occasionally get reworded a little, but the basic meaning is still there. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, they, were, it, they started way back then. That's right, and it's, it's remarkable, and part of it was that there had been this long development of uh, ecological thinking and um, separate movements through the 1960s and 70s. And, and what about the four pillars? The four pillars became the first four of the ten key values. Oh, right. So uh, added to the four pillars were decentralization, mm -hmm. community-based economics, right. feminism and gender equity. Right. Uh, respect for diversity and right. personal and global responsibility. We have to live it in our own lives and yet we have to be responsible for the whole world. And future focus and sustainability. Sustainability you hear a lot about now. Right. But that's uh, basically tied into, okay, right. are we going to be here in the future? Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, so, so many <laughs> of these ideas now are coming into the mainstream language. That's right. But That's back right. then. Back then they were new words. They were used by only a few people. Right. And um, you always had to stop and explain what, what it was all about. <laughs> right. But um, the fact that we've been here and been, been talking about this for a, uh, nearly half a century now. And I've, I've lived through all of that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, uh, a lot of younger Greens don't realize how old the movement mm -hmm. actually is. Mm -hmm. um, first, it, it was just a movement. It always had political intentions, but it was not organized as a political party. Out of the, oh, the 1984 okay. conference, mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, in in relation, thinking of their their value of decentralization, they didn't want to have a, a, a top-heavy, uh, top-down central organization. So they set it up as a group of local local groups united. They called them committees of correspondence. And if you know your colonial history, uh, wow. that was those were the uh, go right back to the American Revolution when mm -hmm. uh, 
plotters like Thomas Jefferson and, and our founding fathers uh, were organized as committees of correspondence sure. to set up uh, you know, uh, their complaints against England and right. so on. Right. Um, and they, the, but the Greens did establish a clearinghouse for those committees, some place that would be a center for the network to keep them connected. And that was established in Kansas City. Oh. Uh, just to facilitate communication and, mm. and support. And this is for the whole country. For the whole country, yeah. right. And uh, so it's, um, even at that point, in that first conference and in the years that uh, came immediately after it, um, ten there were certain tensions in the movement. And this is something also that I think younger Greens aren't aware of. Um, there was one of the tensions was between social ecologists who basically saw uh, the natural world as it, what, was, what was wrong. Our destruction of the natural world was because of our uh, society, the way our society was organized. And, uh, economically? Economically and politically. And politically. And okay. uh, then the deep ecologists who said uh, the basic problem is that human beings think we're the only ones in the world and we aren't giving rights to the uh, other forms of life, both animal and, and plant and, and so on. Uh, there was tension between those two points. Mean, there, there was a con there's a conflict in uh, those positions? The, well, yes, there's a conflict on, on what you emphasize the most. Oh, okay. Um, the deep ecologists, basically, they were essentially anarchist leading and um, uh, you could also uh, you could also uh, term it in in the tr put in terms of the um, new leftist versus uh, ecology minded new agers. Oh, okay. It, and it's a very different point of view and very different um, emphasis mm -hmm. in the movement. Uh, so, uh, as I say, there was they were both aiming at the same things, but from very different perspectives and with different strategies. Oh, interesting. So you had you had attention there. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it spread immediately. The um, uh, the first green that was elected to public office uh, was Is this a, a county commissioner in Bayfield, Wisconsin, in the in the United States, in the whole United States. That was 1986. Yay! Uh, and uh, the. Uh, it, he College was endorsed Green. by a little group called the Lake Superior Green Party. Uh, oh, most good. of the, the uh, first organizations of, of Greens were along local and bioregional lines, not political lines. They weren't state parties. They were uh, Lake Superior Greens. They were St. Croix Valley Greens. Mm -hmm. uh, they were... Uh, Which we still have today, don't we? No. Oh. They pretty much have shriveled. I mean, okay. they could exist, but they're, they're not political oh, okay. because they don't follow political lines. Right. Um, you, you can't really make them uh, work politically very much. Okay. You can certainly make them work in terms of lifestyle and mm -hmm. education and publishing and that sort of thing. Uh, and there may be a few of them still around the country. Okay. Uh, I, I wouldn't say there aren't. Okay. But here in, the, in Minnesota, in the upper Midwest, they have generally sort of shriveled and been replaced by political parties. Okay. Uh, Wisconsin, for example, had the Lake Superior Green Party in 1986, but two, only two years later, in 1988, uh, they organized the Wisconsin State Green Party. Oh, okay. So um, they were the first, one of the first state green parties as well as being the first to elect somebody to public mm -hmm. office. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, nationwide, the, the movement grew. There were a number of national meetings, uh, 1987 in Amherst, Massachusetts. And um, leftist Greens at that point formed a separate organization mm -hmm. called the Left Green Network. And um, basically, it was led by uh, a man whose name may be familiar to some mm -hmm. Greens today, Howie Hawkins. Oh, okay. Uh, he's running for a U.S. Senate in New York on the Green Party ticket. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was the uh, leader. He's been a Green for a long time. I have a lot of personal respect for Howie Hawkins. I've met him several times. He's, he's a good thinker. He's essentially a moderate person. He doesn't engage in a lot of uh, uh, backbiting and, and mm -hmm. attacks. Um, but uh, not 
not the same can be said for all Greens. And no. I think he's been a, a good influence in the Green Party. Uh, but basically, he and the left Green Network were advocating more structure, uh, more uh, central organization, uh, le less consensus decision making. Now, as you know, the Minnesota mm. Green Party still today operates on consensus decision making. Yes. Not entirely. I respect that a you lot. Know, when, when we can't make a consensus work, we resort to a vote. But um, uh, it's quite unique in, po in the political world. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, the left Greens said, that's not going to work. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and to some degree, they were right. You can't carry it too far. Oh, that's interesting. The, the problem with consensus decision making, as I see it, is that if it's carried too far, to too great an extent, it results in the minority uh, pretty much controlling the party. Uh, because by blocking consensus, they can do that. Oh, right. So, um, in any case, that's... How, how, how often, like, what percentage of the time does consensus work, and what percentage of the time it, do, it, people, do you need to go to vote? I would say that it works most of the time. Most of the in time? In my experience, yes. with the Minnesota Green Party. Yes. Now, that may not reflect other Greens in other parts okay. of the country. Um, but here in Minnesota, my own experience is that most of the time it has worked. But there have been times mm -hmm. when it didn't. And sometimes it means that you can't make a decision quickly enough for the political world. Oh, right. Because in the political world, you have right. to respond. Uh, you're not planning ahead uh, like a nonprofit uh, organization is in, the, right. in, in other parts of the world. You have to respond to sudden events and make decisions very quickly and consensus doesn't always work in that case because not everybody gets up to speed fast enough. Okay. <laughs> but but uh, all across the country and internationally is consensus at the uh, core? No, of that's not decisions? true. I think in the United States it started out that way mm -hmm. and uh, I think it that prevails pretty generally throughout the United States. Other countries I really can't say. Okay. I don't know. Uh, and I would guess that it, it varies a great deal by country, by their own cultural traditions. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> so, so as I say, we, oh, we went on from, there were national gatherings in 87, 89, mm -hmm. um, 90. And um, in 91, a, a new, new split was developing, new tension between those who really were movement greens who wanted to work at education, maybe publishing, uh, and were very interested in lifestyle, walking your talk as greens, mm -hmm. riding bicycles, mm -hmm. organic farming, mm -hmm. going back to the land, um, and those who were interested in political action. I mean, this is all, all this other stuff, this lifestyle stuff is good, but come on. Right. <laughs> we're talking power. Yes. And uh, to do that, we have to be politically organized. Right. And they're two very different points of view. Exactly. And um, at uh, 1991, at Elkins, West Virginia, um, there came a split in the Green Party, in the Green Movement, um, mm. between those two elements. <clears throat> One of it, uh, the, the Green Movement up to that time had been a membership organization. You paid your dues and you became a member. You can't organize a political party that way. Legally, you, uh, at least in this state and in most states, you can't charge dues to belong to a political party. And um, mm. so it was, uh, it was not a, uh, it was just not, there was no, nothing in the way the Green uh, Movement was organized that would allow political parties to uh, to focus in, uh, to become, uh, well, to, to merge with them. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, a number of states had already been forming political parties. As I, I mentioned, Wisconsin had. Yes. Um, Maine was the first in 1984, right away. Uh, Wisconsin was second. Mm -hmm. uh, Alaska came along third in 1990 and uh, ran a candidate for governor and got on the ballot. First ballot line for Green Party in Alaska. Uh, California did the same in 1991. They got on the ballot. Um, Hawaii in 1992. So you're, you see, uh, this was developing mostly in the West. Um, 
And um, the green movement was not organized to deal with it, really. Mm -hmm. So there, as I say, there was a split. And they tried to. They formed what is called, was called, still is called, the Greens slash Green Party USA, or G GP USA. Oh, that's where that comes that, from. And that, um, um, they hoped, they, they allowed political parties to join, but only as affiliates. They couldn't vote in the Green Movement. And the political parties, the leadership of uh, those who were advocating more political action, one of them was a man named John Rensenbrink from Maine, who's originally from Minnesota, but uh, hmm. has lived most of his life in Maine. Uh, he was a spokesperson and has written a good bit about the history of this split. In any case, that was 1991. The next uh, national gathering was held here in Minneapolis, okay. Minnesota, at Augsburg College. Mm -hmm. And it was the GGPUSA. Uh, they figured they had, they had solved the problem. Uh, they would represent the whole Green Movement now, including the Green Parties, mm -hmm. and we were going to go ahead. And it was a great convention. There was a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, was a little bit upstaged because uh, President Clinton came to town the same week, and you know he was running for office, so you know we got upstaged a bit. He but. heard about it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had some demonstrations, um, but it was also um, boycotted by uh, John Rensenbrink and the uh, a number of those who wanted to organize a political, a more political organization. Interesting. Uh, so. Um, uh, for whatever reason, it was also a rather expensive uh, convention. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was hosted by the Twin Cities Greens, Minnesota Greens. Mm -hmm. By that time, we had Twin Cities Greens, we had a uh, little um, uh, organizations, uh, local organizations in places like Winona, Rochester, Pine City, and Cato. Uh, we had formed what we called the Minnesota Green Confederation, labored mightily on <laughs> developing a constitution for it. We were publishing a small newsletter, uh, which I was helping to edit. Um, Keith Nybach was uh, actually hmm. putting it out. He's still still around. I'm not very active with the Greens anymore. But um, so it was called the Sunflower. Oh. Uh, it was a that was the beginning new, of the news, Sunflower. Newsletter format, of yes. course. And um, so we had a statewide organization but uh, it was, uh, and it had political uh, aspirations, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a political party. Mm -hmm. And um, in 1992, uh, as I say, the convention at Augsburg was a very expensive one. Uh, there, were e there was every intention of the GGP USA indulging in a big expansion, fundraising, mm -hmm. growing membership. They were sure this was going to happen, but it just didn't. Oh my. Uh, so it, the financial world internal fell dissension. On. I don't know exactly what oh. happened. I wouldn't want to throw uh, stones right. at anyone, but it was one of those things that happens, and the whole thing fell apart. As a oh. result, Minnesota Greens were stuck with part of the the debt for this, <laughs> That's uh, which pretty much wiped us out as an organization. <laughs> oh dear. Um, I guess I'd describe the next year as a, just a general meltdown of the Green movement throughout the country, and here in Minnesota. Mm. Uh, by 1994, we were faced with uh, evaporating membership and uh, disappearing locals, and uh, we uh, uh, looked around and said, "Well, what can we do? Shall we shall we disband?" Nobody wanted to do that. No. Well, we haven't tried being a political party. Let's try that. We've got not a thing to lose. So we uh, sent out a, a little. Uh, mailing to all of our all the people we knew and raised a little money and we had one devoted member who spent about four months of his life making contacts around the state and setting things up and we held our first convention at the very end of December in 1994. Oh, this is a state convention? Statewide convention held in Minneapolis, where oh, else? Okay, <laughs> of course. At the Brian Coyle Center. Yeah. And um, so that was the beginning of the Green Party of Minnesota. And, uh, you know, what is the beginning, uh, y y it can be defined in different ways. Yes. But in some ways, that was the party, the beginning mm -hmm. of the party. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, we drew up in the year that followed, we drew up a constitution, which in some ways very few of us had any experience organizing a political party, uh, so that constitution has had to be modified over the years, but we're mm -hmm. still using it. And um, so we, um, uh, we, we moved ahead. And uh, as I have said to a number of people, the Green Party has dis survived any number of disasters in the time that I've been attached to it and watching it. And yet it always, it always is there. It always, it always comes back. survives. And uh, I, think, I think the reason is because it is so desperately needed. It is yes. the only party that is facing the real issues that face right. humanity today right. and face this country. Now people are be just beginning to admit that, to see it, and to take up some of those issues in other, in other right. forums. Right. But um, for a long time, the Green Party was it. And um, so the, the rest is, uh, you know, uh, the story of the party. Um, in 1995, the year after, six months after we were organized, there was a, another national gathering that was hosted by the Green Party of New Mexico, which also was a political party. Mm -hmm. They had just elected council, city council members in Santa Fe, and they were, they were uh, going for bear. <laughs> <laughs> so they called a national meeting of mm -hmm. both factions of the Greens, and we all met, and uh, I, I went to that. Uh, Holly Bryan from Minneapolis went, and there okay. may have been other Minnesota Greens there. I don't honestly recall. I mm -hmm. think there were several others. Mm -hmm. but I don't recall who they were. And um, then in 1996, uh, uh, that, that national convention decided not to enter the presidential election of 1996. But the state Green parties, a number of them from around the country, were not satisfied with that decision. Minnesota joined those who uh, agreed to support Ralph Nader and Winona LaDuke. To, in 1996. Right. Uh, so uh, we did. We and we had to because we were still a minor party then. Right. We had to get signatures, uh, petition oh to get Ralph Nader on the ballot. But we did that nationally. No, in Minnesota. In Minnesota. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Nationally, all all elections are conducted by states. Right. Ex and, okay. Uh, the laws differ immensely. Okay. Minnesota's, in terms of minor parties getting on the ballot. Minnesota is not too bad. Mm -hmm. uh, there are ways in which it could be improved a lot and opened up a lot. You're uh, not the saying time period is very short. It's more difficult than other states? But it's much more difficult oh, than many other states. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard, hard to believe after you've been out there yes, pounding exactly. the pavement trying to get signatures. It's but, not easy here. Uh, right, it's not. But um, 96, of course, there was a presidential election. That always gets people uh, pumped mm -hmm. up. And, um, uh, and a number of new members and new leadership came into the party. One of the people that came in at that point was Ken Pantel, who was a yes. personally a great admirer of Ralph Nader. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the, I think it was uh, that year or the next year, uh, the Sunflower was revived. Holly Bryan, uh, mm -hmm. who was a graphic designer and, and publisher, uh, started bringing out the Sunflower, this mm -hmm. time in uh, news, show the newspaper format. Yes, this Here is, we go. This was the new format that yes. it had. It's a uh, sort of uh, newspaper. And um, Dreams Forge Ahead. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But this wasn't one of her issues. This was from yes. uh, 2004. But mm -hmm. she, um, uh, she revived it. and. Uh, and uh, put it out for a number of years herself. Uh, it's it's come out sporadically. It isn't, you know, it doesn't come out mm -hmm. on time, on, on uh, deadline every time. But mm -hmm. it uh, it keeps coming out. We've just published one uh, this past August uh, for 2006. So we, it comes out once a year. No, it does. Okay. Uh, it, for a while, it came out. Uh, four times a year, but actually it was probably more like three. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, that, was, that was an unusual, that was when we were a major party. There right. was a little more money and we had two very devoted editors who volunteered their time. Mm -hmm. um, also in 97, we uh, opened our first mm -hmm. 
office in the Arise bookstore over in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And um, we, Minnesota got its first uh, green office holder when uh, Annie Young, who was uh, uh, already serving on the Minneapolis Parks uh, Board, was uh, decided she was a green. And uh, when she was up for re-election, she ran as a green and was re-elected. She's still on the Parks Board, yes, she and she's is. still a, a major force in the Green Party Yes, in Minneapolis. And um, we also started forming new groups around the state. By 1998, there were locals in Minneapolis and St. Paul, Duluth, and um, Mankato, and others coming along. Uh, in 1998, Ken, Ken Pentel ran for, Green Par uh, for governor on the Green Party ticket. And uh, again, we had to get him on the ballot by getting mm -hmm. petitions signed. Mm -hmm. His running mate was Susan Jasper, a Native mm -hmm. American yeah, woman. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, he only got, I think it was, I don't remember the exact figure, it was about 1% of the vote. But that was the year Jesse Ventura was elected. Oh. And um, it, uh, the very fact of a um, third party person being elected governor, which surprised everybody, yes. astounded everybody, turned a great deal more of attention to smaller parties and right. opened up uh, the political process in Minnesota. We do owe, uh, though Jesse Ventura was no green, we do owe uh, a good deal to the fact of his election and the, and the emergence of the Independence Party. Right. We, we welcome other smaller parties. Parties. We don't yes. see them as, as enemies. Uh, yes. They may disagree with us on issues, but but the state needs more, right. more open politics. Right. And that's always been a green position. Uh, in uh, 1999, uh, Duluth came on, into the news when Russ Stewart was elected to the Duluth City Council. He, had, uh, he was a member of the Green Party. He also got DFL endorsement in Duluth. And, um, Didn't he have both endorsements? Uh, for nonpartisan offices, you can't. Okay. Not for partisan offices. Okay. We have an anti-fusion law that only one party's name can appear on the ballot. But where you have nonpartisan offices with no party listed, then you can have multiple endorsements. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, incidentally, in 1999, the Green Party was very supportive and took active part in the uh, Highway 55 demonstrations which was not altogether that. popular at the time, no. but um, uh, we were there. And at the same time, we were getting, growing out state. Locals were formed in Bemidji with a strong Native American leadership and, and membership, and in St. Cloud and in Northfield, which as a college town is not all that surprising. Mm -hmm. But um, our big break, breakthrough, of course, came in 2000, when uh, Nader again ran for uh, 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 president, and um, we held a state convention in, in Minneapolis and nominated Nader. Of course, again, we had to get him on the ballot by mm -hmm. petition. Uh, we also endorsed Holly Bryan for state representative in District right. 62B over in Minneapolis, and mm -hmm. Scott Ruskiewicz for Congress in the 4th District. And um, Nader visited uh, Minnesota in September. And uh, I'm sure almost every green in the state will remember uh, <laughs> the meeting that he had, the mass meeting in the Target Center with 10,000 right. people. And uh, yeah. Nader, in the election that year, got slightly over 5% of the Minnesota vote, even though Minnesota did go for Gore. Uh, it was, uh, it was a, an impressive showing of Minnesota's basic progressive voters. Yes. Yes. And, of course, that made, because 5% is the cutoff point, uh, the Greens became a major party in Minnesota. And perhaps some of, some of the um, popularity of Nader and some of his vote may have been the fact that his running mate was Winona LaDuke, a Minnesota Native American woman, very right. well known, very a leader for many years mm -hmm. up on the White Earth Reservation. So we... Um, uh, as I say, we were a major party then yes. from 2001 until 2005. Yes, exciting year. It's, it was a very exciting year. And uh, some would say disastrous for the Green Party. I don't feel that way at all. Hmm. Certainly in Minnesota, it wasn't disastrous. Mm -hmm. 
the next year, two Green candidates, Dean Zimmerman and Natalie Johnson Lee, were elected to the Minnesota uh, Minneapolis City Council. Mm -hmm. And uh, other candidates also ran strongly. Cam Gordon almost made it that year onto the city council mm -hmm. too. Um, we opened another office, our own office mm -hmm. on West Lake Street. Uh, so the following year, Green Party caucuses, because we were a major party, we were required by law to have hold caucuses. I mean, that's part of Minnesota electoral law. Major parties hold caucuses throughout the state. Mm -hmm. And um, we did. Uh, we had uh, caucuses in 64 of the state's 67 Senate districts. And for a small party, that was a major, major effort. Wow. And of course, it brought in a lot more people. We oh, probably yes. doubled, uh, I, I won't say our membership, but our supporters yes. throughout the state. And um, at a convention in St. Cloud uh, held that spring, uh, statewide candidates were named Ken Pentel for governor, Ed McGaw for U.S. Senate, yes. Dave Berger for state auditor, and yes. Andrew Cabrick for secretary of state. Right. Uh, wasn't, there was, I think it's uh, only honest to recognize that there was bitter debate at that convention over whether we should run someone against Paul Wellstone, who was up for re-election that oh. year. Many Greens were, uh, were torn about this, and the party itself was, was torn. Um, the nomination of Ed McGaugh immediately was recognized as a mistake. Uh, Ed oh. uh, is Native American, a strong spokesperson, but yes. not a Green. And uh, we, uh, his position, uh, particularly in relation to the military and war, was simply not a Green position. And oh. As a result, another um, uh, Ray Tricomo of uh, St. Paul ran against him and uh, won the primary. All the Greens basically voted for Ray Tricomo instead of Ed Maga. So even though Ed was the endorsed candidate that year, Ray Tricomo ended up being our candidate in the final election. Um, there were also some candidates for congressional three, uh, in the fifth, the first, uh, for first, fourth, and fifth districts, there were Green Party candidates. Um, well, none of them, none of our statewide candidates reached the minimum that was needed to continue our major party status, though that does continue for several years automatically until the next presidential election. Uh, the highest vote getter of the bunch was Dave Berger for state auditor. Oh, really? He got 3.67% of the vote. Uh, I was Ken Pentel's running mate. He chose me, uh, and um, Ken and I got, um, uh, I, I think we, it was 2.75%, uh, which uh, was, as I say, less than, less than either Dave Berger or uh, our candidate, uh, Andrew Cabrick, for Secretary of State, who was endorsed by the Minneapolis paper and the Duluth paper. But uh, Andrew also did pretty well. Uh, both of those offices are offices where people are more inclined to vote for Greens because they don't view them as key political offices. They feel they, you know, they may not want to risk getting a, a governor they don't like, but if they have a state auditor or a secretary of state they don't like, well, those are almost nonpartisan offices anyway. And uh, in matter of fact, there is a move afoot in the Green Party to. Uh, advocate that those be made nonpartisan offices because they yes, they that. should be in a way they're mm -hmm. not they're not political offices mm -hmm. but uh, in any case that's for the future mm -hmm. uh, the same year however saw the fact that uh, in Minneapolis redistricting in Minneapolis gerrymandered both of our city council people uh, out of their districts uh, both uh, uh, Natalie Johnson, Lee, and Dean Zimmerman uh, were, uh, their districts were reshaped. Dean had to actually move to stay in his, uh, be a resident of the district that he had been representing. And Natalie Johnson Lee was paired against the only other black city councilman in Minneapolis, mm. which reduced, of course, automatically reduced the representation of the black community uh, in the city council. Um, whichever one won, there would only be one black person. Mm -hmm. uh, both uh, 
continued, of course, until uh, 2005 when uh, they were both defeated. Uh, at the same, in 2003, the Green Party defeated a surprise effort in the state legislature to deprive both it and the Independence Party of major party status. Mm. Uh, that was defeated, but it was tried. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the same year, uh, in St. Paul, uh, Elizabeth Dickinson, who was the chair of the St. Paul Green Local, uh, made a very good showing, in a strong race for yes. city council in the mm -hmm. fifth ward which was an open seat at the mm -hmm. time. So, um, again in 2004, mm -hmm. we had statewide caucus caucuses, and um, uh, again, uh, we sent delegates to the National Convention, and the, at that, as Greens will recall, that was when the question was, would Ralph Nader be backed, mm -hmm. or David Cobb, who became mm -hmm. the nominee of the Green Party. So um, I think Minnesota was pretty evenly split, and we ended up um, uh, with both men on the ballot. Uh, oh, David sure. Cobb, of course, had the Green Party ballot line. We were still a major party at mm -hmm. that point. And uh, a splinter group uh, got enough signatures to get Ralph Nader on the, on the ballot and support his campaign in Minnesota. So uh, both Minnesotans had a choice, right. <laughs> again, <laughs> which I thought was good. Yes. And. Um, a good way to handle that. Yeah, it, and it worked out without a lot of internal bitterness. Uh, nationwide, there was a lot of bitterness, but in Minnesota, I've heard that. Uh, it was uh, mm -hmm. it was fairly uh, live and let live. Mm -hmm. And of course, in 2005, we had uh, uh, no national election, but uh, a couple of green women, Elizabeth Dickinson again, and Farheen. Hakeem uh, both ran strong primary races really? for mayor in St. Paul and Minneapolis, which illustrates the fact that uh, within the cities, there were no Republican candidates. Their opponents were all Democrats. Uh, we are actually a second party mm -hmm. in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. Twin Cities proper, not necessarily the whole yes. metro area. Yes. But, um, uh, and in the same, at the same time, Minneapolis elected, finally elected Cam Gordon to the city council, mm -hmm. where he now serves. And of course, we had the, uh, the sad situation where uh, Dean Zimmerman was, uh, his home and office were raided by the FBI four oh. days before the primary election. And uh, that threw a shadow over him, and uh, he was defeated very narrowly in the final mm -hmm. election. So that brings us to 2006. Where here we are. Here we are. We are now about a month before the election. Minor party. We have a slate of state candidates. Um, yes, we do. We uh, we have a couple candidates for the legislature who are doing very well. Mm -hmm. And um, who Should knows we name how? Name them? Uh, well, yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our candidate for governor again is uh, Ken Pentel, and his yes. running mate is Denine Provencher. Mm -hmm. um, the, we now have a candidate, first time, for Attorney General, Papa John Colstad, yes. who is not an attorney, but as an experienced businessman, mm -hmm. has had a lot to do with the law. Who's going on and the ballot as Papa. That's as right, Papa because John he's too. very well known as a musician. Mm -hmm. He runs mm -hmm. a music business in mm -hmm. Minneapolis, and also a, uh, a music group. Mm -hmm. And Dave Berger, again, running for state auditor. Right. Uh, Mike Cavlin, running for U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. Jay Pond running a second time for uh, U.S. Uh, House House Congressional Fifth Congressional District, right? And then our two legislative candidates, Julie Risser in Senate District 41 in uh, Edina. So and in in that situation, it's a Republican in Julie. Uh, yes, because the Democratic candidate has, uh, because of personal problems, has, ha has withdrawn. Mm -hmm. So who knows how that will turn out? Yes. Uh, Jesse Mortensen in District oh, 64A yeah. in St. Paul. Mm -hmm. And of course, Farheen uh, Hakim, who ran for mayor last year, is running for uh, Hennepin County Commissioner this year. Yes. So that's our, our slate of candidates, and uh, we're working hard for them. Yes. And we are. And also several have a very good chance. Uh, well, I understand. Who knows? I, yes, you know, I we, know. You can't you predict elections. Yes, you, you can't, can't predict elections. And I, I certainly would not want to. Want mm -hmm. to try. I don't have a crystal ball. Mm -hmm. Someday I may get one. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
But one thing we we have high hopes for is getting uh, IRV in Minneapolis oh, and the right. better ballot campaign. Uh, I think the most uh, something all Greens agree on, and it's one of our top issues, is getting a more open electoral system in this country. Yes. Open we should explain instant runoff voting uh, <laughs> just a little bit. It, it's uh, it's really quite simple. You vote for for not just one candidate, but uh, if there are three or four candidates running, you vote for them in the order of your preference. Right. And if the your, first choice. If your first choice is thrown out, then your second choice uh, gets your vote mm -hmm. and on down the, the list so that you, you can afford to vote for somebody you really believe in without automatically throwing the election to somebody that you really, right, really, exactly. really don't want to see right, exactly. So it's, uh, it's a much fairer system. Yes, and at the end we get a majority too. In the end you get a majority. You don't have a situation as we have in Minnesota today where uh, we have a governor elected by a minority of the state's voters. Yes. And this has happened well, this a number of times. kind of happens in almost it, all our elections. Well, not all, not but, all, but, but an, a, an alarming number of them. Know, and yes. it's not a democratic thing. Mm -mm. It's not mm -mm. a good thing. And it undermines our system. So, mm -hmm. as I what say, I, the Green Party stands above all for, for opening up electoral politics, getting the big money out of politics. Yes. Green candidates. One of the things that handicaps us is we accept no money from PACs. Right. Only money from individuals. Mm -hmm. No uh, corporate money. No corporate money. No uh, no big big organization money of any mm -hmm. kind. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there are good organizations that we would be happy to work with, but we will not accept their money. And that's been one of our principles here in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's. Uh, that's where we are. <laughs> and dreams for the future. Yes. And we'll be here. <laughs> and we'll still be here. <laughs> However the elections turn out, we're still going to be here. <laughs> right. And at the, at the time of this program, we can't tell how the elections That's are going right. to turn out. That's right. But um, a lot of good press. Yes. Uh, I, uh, Minneapolis I think Star Tribune just did a great story on Mike Cavlin, well, we've been on mm -hmm, Almanac. Yeah. Yes, we've had uh, good coverage on Almanac, and uh, I think there's a lot of respect for Green Party candidates. More and more and more. The, what we always hear is, we, we love you, but you're not electable. Yes. Well, that's partly the system we have, mm -hmm. the closed system. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, part of it is that uh, people have to bite the bullet and vote their, their hearts and what not they their believe fears. In. Yes, exactly. I hear that so often. I really believe in what the Green Party stands for, but, and then they vote something different. That's right. I don't dare vote for them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't dare. And actually, I consider those people the spoilers because they kind of <laughs> stop the progress from happening if they don't vote for who they believe in. So we have just a couple minutes left. And a dream then of the Green Party is to develop into a multi a multi-party system. system. Right. Uh, ultimately proportional representation. Right. Which is much better than IRV, but IRV is a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And it's a step that is politically feasible right now. San Francisco uh, has IRV and it's working fine there. Great. And uh, Ireland has IRV. They elect their, their whole government by yes. IRV and it works fine. And right. they always have, whoever is in charge has a majority of the vote. Yes. which gives them a much uh, cleaner, clearer system. Yes. And Australia also uses IRV. So it's not untried. No. It's, it's, uh, it's not inventing the wheel. No. But um, proportional representation, such as most of the European countries have, mm -hmm. is for a diverse, a highly diverse society where you have a lot of uh, uh, polarization over particular issues, um, proportional representation is much fairer. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Green Party again is going to bring well, to politics we in Minnesota. We'll keep working on it. As well as all these <laughs> other things. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Well, thank you for this having me. This was a fascinating event. history. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and be able to, yes. to talk to you about it. Well, Because I know you're a fairly new member of the Green yes. Party. And, but uh, devoted. <laughs> well, okay. we thank you for that. Okay. Well, thanks to our audience and tune in again next week.